everyone's here. Hi from DC, welcome. Um, <laughs> the autographs will be zero, ones and zeros. That's too funny, Abby. <laughs> Hopefully you are all tuning in for So You Want an AWS Certification, a fireside chat with two amazing engineers that we have on the webinar today. Um, a couple of logistics. When we get into the fireside chat, if you have questions for these panelists that you would like answered, you can either use the Q&A portion or the chat feature in Zoom. Um, if you would like to see all of our lovely faces on the screen, you can also click through to be in gallery view so that you can see us all talking at the same time, or you can leave it in speaker view, which will just highlight the current speaker who's talking. So let's jump right in. First and foremost, my name is Bree. I'm a senior software engineer at Capital One and uh, one of the newest 2020 leadership fellows. I co-lead our cloud and Python tracks. And this event is being hosted by our cloud track. And I'm really excited to be here and sharing this webinar with you all. I'll go into a little bit for those who are new to the Women Who Code space about our organization background and history. Our mission for Women Who Code is to inspire women to excel in their technology careers. We aim to see a world where women are representative across the technology space as executives and founders and board members and scrum masters and of course software engineers. Women Who Code targets these engineers in industry with two or more years of experience looking to get support for their development and you know leveling up in their careers. All of our events are focused at propelling this mission and targeting our demographic to be amazing technologists in the technology space. For all of our digital channels, the spaces that we meet together, and all of our events, there is a code of conduct. You can find this at womenwhocode.com slash code of conduct. Essentially, to sum it up, Women Who Code is an inclusive community uh, that welcomes any and all individuals who are here to support our mission and further that, that vision that we have um, for this organization. And if you experience, hopefully you don't, um, any form of harassment or a situation that is unwarranted, you can also fill out a form to bring that to our awareness because we do not tolerate um, any form of harassment from our members or to our members. You can also stay connected with the cloud track. As I mentioned, this event is being hosted by uh, the cloud technical community. We currently have six amazing tracks that are formed around a specific space in the technology industry. To stay connected with all that's happening with Women Who Code Cloud, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. You can also join the movement on womenwhocode.com slash cloud. And that's the best way to stay up to date with all of the events that are coming and how you can register for events like these. Hopefully you got <laughs> here through that link. Um, you can also reach myself and Archna the, and the global team at cloud at womenwhocode.com. And we have a YouTube channel where this uh, lovely talk will also be uploaded. All of our talks that we host online are uploaded to the Women Who Code YouTube channel. And finally, we have a Slack space. And if you would like to be added to that, feel free to shoot us a note um, at our email addresses. This page will come up at the end so that you can uh, see it one more time. So without further ado, I have done enough talking. I'm really excited to uh, have the opportunity to hear from these two amazing engineers, a quick little bit of their bios uh, that I will read through. So we have Mary Kate or MK Comer. She is a software developer and technical lead experience in full agile development lifecycle from concept through delivery of enterprise scale data science platforms. MK recently achieved her AWS SA certification and worked closely with her DevOps team to automate workflows leveraging AWS, S3, Lambda, and Jenkins. MK loves music, fiddling, hiking, and coffee. I think if there's time at the end today, MK, I might need to talk a little bit about this fiddling uh, okay. hobby that we have. 
Uh, and then next we have Tiffany Jacha. She is a technical evangelist at Harness. She's an advocate for better software delivery, sharing applicable practices, stories, and content around modern technology. Before joining Harness, Tiffany was a consultant with Red Hat's consulting practice. There she used her experience to help customers build their software applications living in the cloud. Like I said, super excited to have these two amazing women on the chat today. So without further ado, we're gonna have our fireside chat. I am not gonna leave uh, this GIF up so that you can see our faces a little bit more, but I just thought it was funny. That, um, <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so we'll kick it off with a couple of questions that I have teed up for our speakers. Um, and then as I mentioned, if you have any questions, I will be monitoring our chat and the Q&A portion, and we will, you know, get them in front of our, our these lovely engineers. First and foremost, how's it, how are y'all doing this morning? <laughs> Good. Yeah, doing great. Awesome. It's a wonderful, beautiful Friday. Is there anything that I missed in your background that you would like to share with our, our viewership today? Yeah, um, so I, I, I recently got the AWS certification uh, as a solutions architect associate. So that's that's sort of my background. And so if anyone else, I, I see that some people are studying for that exam as well. So if you have any questions around that, happy to answer them. Yeah, likewise, um, I just did the solutions architect associate uh, up two months ago, probably at this point. Uh, so, uh, but typically I think we're gonna roll into different questions Bree, with familiarity with the cloud and, and all that stuff. But yeah, that's pretty much my background. And then I'm also a leadership fellow. So I'm really excited to be here. It's my first uh, chat. Uh, and webinar with women who code. Uh, so thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Awesome. We're excited to have you. All right. So let's dive right in. What was y'all's familiarity with the cloud um, coming up to taking the exam? MK, would you like to? Uh, sure. I'll go first. <laughs> yeah. So on a scale of like zero, having never looked at AWS or, you know, I also have friends not in technology who are like, what are the, what's the cloud? You know what I mean? Um, to 10, like using AWS regularly and architecture dev, I probably would rate myself at like a three. Uh, most of my like professional background has typically just been purely uh, back end Java and software developer, developing mm -hmm. microservices using Java, a little bit of Python. Uh, but that being said, our application um, that I work for um, and work to build out is hosted on AWS. So I was aware that it was a technology we were using. Um, but it wasn't until I was given a feature to implement like a data synchronization service between our store and an external data store that I started um, learning up on AWS messaging with S SNS and SQS. Um, so I would generally consider myself like a, a, on a scale of zero to 10, like a three, but I did have a level of developer experience uh, working with AWS messaging before I started studying for the exam. Awesome. What about you, Tiffany? Yeah, my background's pretty similar to yours, MK. I, um, I had used AWS a couple of times, like spun up uh, a few instances, but I hadn't really, like I didn't really have a use case for looking into other services in AWS. Um, you know, at Red Hat, we, like I, I got into sort of the cloud world through containers and Kubernetes. And so that was a lot of my background. I was just focused on that platform, right? Building applications, deploying them, making sure that they were working. But like I, like the amount that I actually had to interact in AWS or like even managing my own sandbox environments, all of those were, all of those were local. So, you know, I, I like the amount I actually interacted with AWS was very minimal prior to actually taking the exam. So it's safe to say that if you aren't, you know, in and out of the AWS environment, you could still, you know, could look into um, taking the exam. Yeah, so I think there, um, there, so there are three different tiers for AWS exams. There's the practitioner, the associate, and then the pro level. And so they're kind of ranked at that, at those different levels, right? Practitioner is someone who's, who's used AWS before. Maybe they haven't necessarily um, explored all the different services, right? Um, and and so it builds up from that. Uh, associate is, is a little bit more hands-on. Uh, you get uh, more 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 breath on the different services and how to interact with them. And then the pro exam is sort of for people who've had a lot of AWS experience. Maybe they use it at work all, every day, 
or um, they've been using it for the past three or four years, um, mm -hmm. you actually have, I think there's a little bit of a barrier into the pro exams because you actually have to prove that you've spent a certain amount of time within the AWS platform. Interesting. Do you know how uh, they want that proof shared? I'm not sure. I think it's like when you sign up for the exam, I'm not sure if the barrier still exists, but it definitely did like a, a year or half, year and a half ago or something like that. Um, a couple of people were talking about it. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. And on the, for the pro exams, you can actually specialize. So if you only want to learn about certain workloads on AWS, like say for example, you're, you're similar to MK where you work with a lot of data or you're getting into ML, they have special, um, certifications, pro certifications for ML or for networking or for security. And so if you, um, you know, are really looking into getting uh, more in depth or, or more certifications, that's something you can look into. Going along those lines, uh, I think you both chose the SA Solution Architect uh, Associate um, exam. Can you talk a little bit about what made you choose th th that certification? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if, kind of for me, uh, I like to learn like high level and then kind of bring it down. Uh, so it's, per, it's both like a personal like a way of how I learn, but it was more so um, I started at my company uh, architecting like custom software solutions and they would be using different AWS foundations and different services. And I, you know, kept hearing all these, uh, I don't even know if you want to call them buzzwords for these different AWS services. And I was like, what are those? I need to know what these are. Um, and having had a little bit of developer experience with uh, one of the services that AWS offers, I had said to myself, okay, like I want the full picture having known that with great documentation and an understanding, like I can understand the, you know, the developer documentation to go really narrow in on either service if I were to choose. And then that was me choosing between the developer certification and the SA certification. Um, so I wanted the more like generalist, larger scope architecture and how to design like enterprise scale, like serverless applications. Um, mm -hmm. That was the question that I had asked and that's the question I wanted to answer. So that's how I ended up choosing the solutions architect. Awesome. What about you, Tiffany? It was similar for me. Uh, I had just gotten into a new role at Harness. So Harness is a startup and so I had just moved to Harness and uh, I, uh, as an evangelist, you do a lot of, you have a lot of conversations with developers, but you also have a lot of conversations with potential customers. And so it's really important to be able to say like what the trade-offs are and, and sort of being able to architect at a high level, um, sort of the different services and, and the trade-offs between those two. And so for me, it, it was kind of like a natural, it was also kind of a natural progression where I was seeing myself like, okay, I'm, I'm eventually gonna have to give architectural suggestions or recommendations. So it, it was sort of like the, the most, um, like it was the path that made the most sense. Mm -hmm. I think if you're gonna be a little bit more hands-on or you're, you're gonna be actually using those services every day, it may be worth getting, uh, it, it may be worth taking the developer associate exam. Uh, I think at least for the associate architect Oh, no, solutions architect associate exam. It's very similar to the practitioner exam, uh, the, the SA practitioner exam. And so if you feel like you're really spending a lot of time studying and you're understanding a lot of the concepts, you may easily be able to just upgrade and, and go straight for the associate exam instead of taking like a practitioner exam and then eventually getting the pro exam, the, eventually getting the associate exam and then pro. Mm -hmm. um, it may just save you some time and money. And that's, that's, I had heard a similar thing with the uh, practitioner exam, uh, talking to other coworkers who had received the practitioner exam, and I was just decided to skip over and go straight for the SA. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of what you said, I've definitely heard the same things just in the, in the AWS certification world. That is a great insight and kind of leads into a question that I had. Um, so I was certified uh, three years ago, so I'm, which is why I'm super interested because I need to get recertified. Um, and at the time, the common theme that I was hearing is that if you get the essay, because it's so much broader, it will encompass almost uh, a good majority of what you would need for the developer. And so that if you knock out the essay, you could quickly, you know, learn a couple of additional items to knock out the developer. Is that still the same as well? Do you know? Yeah, I think it's the same. Um, it goes the other way around as well. If you take mm -hmm. the 
and then uh, take, you can easily take the essay because the concepts are the major concepts are there. Uh, some of the yeah. more like some of the nuances, right? You're gonna obviously have to study uh, for either exam, but yeah, it, there's a lot of overlap. Um, and if you look at if you actually look at AWS, they'll give you uh, a breakdown of the percentage of types of questions. They were planning to change. Uh, they were planning to roll out a new version of the SAA exam, the Solutions Architect Associate exam, where they were going to break down a couple more of the topics and leave certain things certain things out of the SAA exam and keep them in the developer exam. But I think the, the way it's set up now with SAA version one, it's very similar to the developer. So mm -hmm. you can either or. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who say like one is easier than the other, but you can't really you can't really ha I mean that's still a matter of opinion and background, right? There's a lot of people who come from an operations background or a networking background who say SAA is so much easier than dev. And then like someone from a dev background saying like, dev is so much easier than SAA. Just some uh, some things that I've noticed. And and so really take it all with a grain of salt. And you know, if when you're going to study and looking at the topics on the exam, like figure out what, what you do and don't know before before kind of um, making a decision. Mm. Yeah. That's great. All right, we'll take some of our questions from our audience members. Uh, Abby asks, she wants to hear what study materials you used. Um, and then I'll say the second question for after that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, this is kind of just getting to the resources. And, and uh, so I was trying to decide whether or not to do like the full blown in person back when it was in person training course versus self paced studying. I ultimately decided to do self-paced just for my life. Uh, it made a lot more sense. Um, so I used Udemy uh, and I can actually provide the links of, for what I used. I used the Udemy AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate 2020 and it was 26 hours of training material. And then on top of that, I used the Udemy um, AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate practice exams where there's hundreds and hundreds of questions. Um, so between those two materials, I was obviously very busy. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, using AWS white papers, um, but that is essentially how I, I prepared and practiced for the exam. Um, yeah, it's kind of different. Uh, there are, I believe, still like live training courses you could do in person. Um, I, they're all remote, obviously, with COVID. Uh, but I, at least for me, I found that the resources online were enough. I didn't necessarily need someone live in person for, for questions. And at least how my brain processes things, I liked doing like sections and absorbing that information over time as opposed to like crash course, um, I would say. Um, and also the, if you're cost conscious, actually doing an in-person training is definitely more expensive than necessarily doing like an online course. Two follow-up questions for that. Was Udemy, uh, um, you paid for that? Yes. Yeah. And then was that a mixture of lecture and hands-on or? Yeah, absolutely. So the Udemy AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate 2020, um, I can send the link as well. Uh, it would intermix between uh, presentations and doing labs um, and doing labs um, kind of, I, I would say live doing labs, but yeah, in person kind of doing labs. Um, and I mixed in and out of doing those labs as well as the um, actual just PowerPoint presentations and taking notes. Um, that being said, as we were saying before, the developer versus solutions architect, I started to notice as I was doing the course that a lot of the slides uh, were on the bottom left said AWS uh, developer. So there's a lot of material crossover between SA and developer. Mm -hmm. um, so just keeping that in mind, but you do have to start somewhere. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of what I would do is, and we kind of could go into this more like the study routine and how I broke it up. Um, but I would do, you know, a two or three sections a day, and then I would do the labs on them. Um, and it, I didn't hit the practice test until I finished the full 26 hour course, which realistically took me more like 30, 35 hours to do with the labs. Gotcha. I will piggyback uh, a little bit more into your study sessions and how long you took to study. But first, Tiffany, what resources uh, did you use? Yeah, I, uh, I actually followed the same path as MK. I was on I was on Udemy buying uh, courses. And so um, if you don't know what Udemy is, it's, it's similar to every other online training um, platform. You can buy, you can purchase courses and study off of that platform. And so uh, there's a couple, when you go and look at, at, at different courses, there's a couple of different ones for AWS. A Cloud Guru 
as um, they're, they're a startup, they're a small company, uh, but they do a lot of training courses on all of the AWS uh, certifications. The guy who runs it, his name, uh, his name is Ryan uh, Kornberg, I think. And he, uh, he actually takes the exams like every month. Like he takes all like, like just through the, uh, the rackets, taking classes all the time. And so he can tell, he, can, he gives you insights when you're taking the exam, like, oh, this, this part, this section will be like a majority of the exam. So you need to know concepts around storage. You need to know concepts around VPCs. And so he'll give you that heads up. And then at the end of each of those training, uh, like each of those like sections, there's a little bit of like a practice exam that you can take that just covers like, do you know these concepts? Um, and, but the problem is like you have these hands-on labs and a lot of theory, right? You don't really know what the exam looks like, right? You don't, and that's one of the, uh, one of the things that scared me the most, right? It was gonna be my first AWS exam. Um, I, only, I was only allowed one try. <laughs> so it was like, there is, no, there is no backup plan for this. Like I either, I either pass or I don't, you know, I either get it or I don't. And, and so I ended up see, like I ended up looking at the sort of like the chat boxes and what people use to pass. And what came up was John Bonzo's AWS certified SA um, and um, C, CD uh, certified developer practice exams. And those practice exams are, were, um, they're really, they're very similar. Like all the format and everything is very similar to the exam, like almost hands down the same, like similar questions. But the only thing was those questions were harder. Um, and so I was taking, they, it comes with in a bundle, so you get six exams. Uh, I followed, like, I, it was pretty much the same thing as what MK did. I watched all of the A Cloud Guru videos first, all the lecture videos, and then I took the practice exams. And if I, and if you fail any parts of the, if you get any of the questions wrong, they actually tell you why you got them wrong and how to study for them. Uh, and so I knew what areas I had to like rewatch and kind of like try to under re understand because the first time you see anything, you're, you're still trying to figure it out, right? I'd just go back and rewatch it on the ACOG Guru's uh, training site. I mean, ACOG Guru is also a website, so you could buy the training course from there. And I think you get like, you get like the free instances and whatnot. Um, the only thing that was different was when I was watching the training exams, I knew how to like, I knew how to. SSH into an EC2 instance, and you had to do like certain things, certain labs, and so I just played them at two times the speed. Um, mm. So there's there's a little bit of shortcutting that you can do, and based off of how you do on the uh, on John Bonzo's uh, practice exams, you'll pretty much know if you're passing or not, if you will pass or not. Uh, as a rule of thumb, like the highest score I got, I, I only took the practice, I only took like four practice exams, and the highest score I got was like a uh, it was like a 67 or something, wow. but then I ended up scoring almost a nine, like 900 out of a thousand on the AWS. Wow. Exam. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, you it's know, like you're the, the major parts, you know, that you're going to be able to pass the exam. <laughs> I know a lot of people have testing anxiety. I do too. Like I'm, I'm really bad about testing anxiety. But this is like a good way to know, like for sure, like that success is pretty predictable and that you can do it. Yeah, I'd have to piggyback off that. That was like the most shocking thing was going from uh, the training courses and doing some of the labs. And, uh, you know, at each end of the section, there would be like the practice questions, like were you listening questions? And I would do it and I'd be like, oh, I'm so good, I got this. Hey. <laughs> Um, I was like, I'm so smart, move it along. And then I, you know, I went to go do the practice exam and I literally got like between 50 and 60% on almost all of them. And I was like, what the heck? Like, I thought I was good to go and you know, I needed 80%. Um, and then similar story, like I, and that's the thing I've told most people when they ask, I was like, when you do those practice exams, like if you're getting between 50 and 60%, like that's what I was getting. And I ended up getting a 90% on the exam. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it totally freaked me out. And I, and then I went to redo one of them, just like as a proof of concept. I was like, okay, am I actually learning or why do I keep getting the same score? Um, and, and then I actually ended up redoing one or two of them and I got like a 90% the second time, uh, you know, after doing them like a week or two later when I forgot the questions. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the biggest piece of advice is that you're not necessarily going to be getting like a passing score, or at least I didn't get a passing score on the practice exams. Um, so just point of reference there. 
Um, and then, yeah, and then also one thing I did start to notice as well is in the package uh, that we'll share, I think we probably honestly did the same practice exams. There were five exams they gave you. Um, they, or at least the ones I had, like ranged in different like areas of focus. So when I kept like literally getting like 55%, 55%, 55%, 55% on all four of them, I was like, what? And then I started to realize that a lot of them had like kind of concentrated questions um but just based on the set that i did so by doing all like four or five of them i was getting like a wide wide range of like every possible assortment of questions they could ask um but again uh i believe someone just asked in the chat where do you get these practice exams same thing uh udemy also order like you can also just um buy them as well um on top of the course if we yep. you two yeah. want to send me the links we can share these out in our slack channel um mm -hmm. as well we have a AWS study group channel in the Women Who Code Cloud, um, yeah. but we can also put them here for folks who are trying to follow along. I think Tiffany posted a link to the practice exam. Um, I love that that little bit of insight. It's kind of like your um, introductory college weed out course where <laughs> they make it super hard and you get nervous and you're like, is this right for me? And then you go and you continue along and you're, you end up crushing it. Um, but it's just seeing who I guess is along for the ride <laughs> yeah i also have another thing to add um i forgot to mention uh aws actually has a practice exam it's like 10 questions that you can take and if you can get all of them right then you know you're gonna get, you're gonna be good i actually didn't look or take that exam until i had finished everything like until i finished like the training courses and until i i like basically had gone through most of the practice exams uh, because I already knew like the format and everything. And then I looked at that and I took it and I got a hundred. So make sure you are, it's like right before you take that test, take that, take that right before you take your exam, your AWS exam, take that practice exam and make sure you can get all the questions, right? They're straightforward. Um, there's only 10 questions. The answers are at the bottom. I actually have a link to that. I can also share that for the SAA exam. Awesome. These are great resources. I love it. Um, going to another question from Andrea. How did you decide to use AWS versus other cloud service providers? And which exam is most attractive to employers for AWS? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. So, because I've done the Azure uh, data science as well, um, and I recently did that. Those were kind of my two quarantine activities, um, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah, I don't like so for AWS for me, it's like the platform that uh, my company is really building all of our, our uh, platforms on or off of. So there's definitely a lot more buy-in on my end to learn AWS because I can actually practice what I learn, right? Um, and I've even found personally, like doing the data science training on a different cloud platform that I'm not necessarily using. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to like kind of put it to practice is what I'm saying. Um, but I mean, I don't know, AWS is definitely obviously one of the biggest cloud providers and dominates the market in terms of um, cloud, but there's so many different other resources and other clouds out there that uh, likewise are, you know, people, employers want skills for. Um, like, for example, mine was like really excited that I was doing Azure data science because like no one had really done that one yet, but mm -hmm. has it yet to be like kind of, I guess, utilized in my day to day, like it hasn't. So um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it was kind of a personal decision as to what, um, you know, what I'd be using more regularly. Um, but yeah, I don't know, uh, Tiffany, if you have anything kind of piggybacking. Yeah. It was uh, it was similar for me, like uh, about, uh, uh, the majority of Harness customers are on AWS. Like we have a, a subset of people on GCP, on, on Google uh, Cloud or <clears throat> Azure. And and so it, it, it like we're, we're pretty cloud and public cloud agnostic. But uh, one of the things I noticed was like <clears throat> a lot of our enablement, a lot of our workshops, the things like if I were to run like uh, like a little training session on Harness, I'd probably most likely go to AWS for that. I was like, yeah, it's it's just what I'm going to be using at work. If you are, um, you know, looking for, if you're looking to start your career and you <clears throat> haven't necessarily decided, like, what do I want to go for? <clears throat> try to think about where you would want to work or what industry you would want to work in. <clears throat> because I know for um, GCP, for example, 
a lot of data science, uh, like ML users will love a lot of the services that Google's coming out with. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot more investment into that. <clears throat> and so you may look into that versus maybe, you know, you do want to work for Amazon one day, <laughs> then maybe it's worth getting an AWS certification. So just try to think about like, sort of what are you interested in? What, you know, even at school, what are you specializing in? What are the classes you take, uh, are you taking? What are the, you know, uh, what are the, the platforms that you're going to eventually be using? Um, again, like AWS is really popular. So if you're just looking to uh, dip your feet in, it's it's not it's not expensive to start in and the payoff's pretty nice, right? I think like to take an exam, any of the exams, it's only $150. And, you know, I've, uh, I've seen I've seen com some companies charge four hundred dollars, like Red Hat charges four hundred dollars, um, and it's a hands-on exam, one hundred percent hands-on exam. But AWS isn't like that; it's one hundred percent multiple choice, um, and it's one hundred fifty dollars. And now you can take them online. You can get the practice, uh, like the proctor. You can get the exams proctored online. Um, it's nice because they also have a lot of testing centers. I think that they work with two different vendors uh, to provide testing centers, Pearson and another one I forgot, but because of that, they have so many different locations that you don't have to drive like two or three hours to get to a to, to one like exam location. And so it's just, it's really accessible for people. And I've seen, I've seen people tell stories around like, oh, this exam just like, it's really hard for me to drive to take this exam. And, you know, if I fail, I have to drive like another three hours, like you have to do all this commuting, right? And it, it can be really, it can be really tough. So that's, that's sort of my advice on that. Yeah, and uh, piggybacking off that, I, I actually took it remote uh, because it was in the middle of COVID. <laughs> so um, uh, like on top of already having decided to like self-paced study um, because courses, like I was saying earlier, like in-person courses are thousands of dollars to get certified. I don't know if anyone is aware, but like some of the courses my company was like, yeah, do this. It's like five days. And I was like, five days for like a couple thousand dollars. That's nuts, you know? Um, but yeah, so I actually took it remotely and I would, I would, I would definitely say it was, it was very easy and pretty smooth. Um, you, and I don't know if anyone wants to hear about the experience of taking it remotely, but Thank you, you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you sign up for, uh, it's through Pearson View, they're offering everything remotely, and you basically download software um, on your computer that obviously locks it in place that therefore you can't be on other tabs or you can't be on the internet and whatnot. Uh, so you download their software, and then you get on like 15 minutes before the exam, and you actually have an in-person practitioner, like, pro like person, like, I don't know, is, what's the word for when Proctor. somebody... Yeah, proctor, I'm forgetting that word from school, proctoring the exam, um, and they proctor the exam, they let you into the exam, and then you're not, they have to take pictures of your workstation, it was really interesting, you take pictures of your workstation, 360 view, submit that with your license, um, and then when the proctor comes on, they take your, they ask you to take your computer and like, do a 360 of the room to make sure there's no study material or you're not like looking at a second you're not allowed to use a second screen i noticed with the software you can't even have a second screen available so it's honestly just your computer and your charger in an empty room and the proctor lets you into the exam and it takes about two hours and then you're done and it literally tells you right after if you passed or failed which is cool and then they send you the scores i got them like 36 hours maybe 48 hours after taking the exam so you can do it remotely, like on top of, you know, not necessarily having to commute, but they've adapted really well to all the COVID stuff. So um, I don't know if anyone has a more specific questions there, but that was my experience. And um, I also had issues with Wi-Fi at one point where like I got an error from the, you know, portal and it, they just let me back in and they were really helpful um, throughout the process. So. so they figured out and ironed out all the kinks because that was uh, my yeah. big question. Yeah. I was like totally panic freaking out like I was on my first question and I like hit a button a back button and it like didn't work I don't even know anyway I was getting like a bad gateway some sort of error and I was like uh do I just oh, sit here? What do I do? like this is like everyone's worst nightmare taking an exam remotely um and I ended up just calling them being like hey I'm like I can't get on my exam there's some sort of error code whatever um and then they I like read like closed out of the software, went back in, they let me back in and they gave like refunded my time per se. So there's actually a live proctor there that you ping and say, hey, I'm having an issue. And then they are proctoring many different people exams. And then it took like, honestly, almost 10 minutes for the proctor to get back to me, which, you know, I was just kind of sitting there super nervous. And then they were like, hey, like, sorry, like, let me, I'll kick you out and I'll let you back in. 
Um, but they, yeah, they're not gonna fail you if you have an issue with technology, but um, I would have to say it was a good experience all in all, okay. given, given um, you know, circumstance, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we have another question about, very specific about the details on the test. And it says, how, on the test, how much did you have to know the specific IOPS or megabits per second of EBS and EF, EFS flavors and the technical specification of EC2? Like, did you have to know the difference between the instance types or anything like that, like specifically? Yeah, you have to know the difference between the instance types, but you don't need to know exact numbers. Okay. So if I were to come into the exam and I don't know the difference between EBS, EFS, EC2, or that there's different instance types for that, I'd be a little bit in trouble, right? Because you obviously have to know, okay, what's the difference between on-demand versus reserved instances? You, you do have to know those things. You, you have to know that they're broken down. Um, and if you actually look at the AWS um, A Cloud Guru exam um, training material, they'll tell you what you need to know and what you don't need to know. You never need to know the numbers. You're you're pretty good there. I think like conceptually, like for a bunch of the different services, like I had to like put them in my head on a scale. That's what helped me like between like the like obviously like the lowest versus the highest or whatever the comparison was. I would have that's what you had to know it was more conceptual than it was necessarily like strictly numbers, but. Um, yeah, you do have to know kind of more details. Um, a surprising, I at first was like, there's no way they're going to ask me that. You know what I mean? When you're doing the course and you know, they do, they do expect you to know some, some lower level details um, about different services. And a huge point of the exam I found was like, honestly, being able to compare different services or different variations of services and, and understand how they intertwine into like the whole um, AWS, like enterprise, like architecture, I'd say. Um, so when you zoom in, right, and you're learning a specific service, I found you really had to zoom back out and see like the big picture with the essay exam specifically. Yeah, I, I think that's that speaks to like sort of the SA role as well. They'll give you in like the exam, they'll give you the scenario where they're like, this person's work, you're working for this company and you're this type of person and we're trying to migrate from here to here. Um, we want to use EBS, EFS, suggest the, you know, the tier, like the perfect combination of solutions that'll get you this type of result. Um, mm -hmm. So like, it's, it's very like use case heavy. Like it's like, oh, I'm a customer. I want to use a couple of AWS serv services to get um, the best, uh, you know, storage solution for me not accessing my data that often. Like it's it's very like it's very like framed in that way. Like it's a story, and so you just have to be able to weed through the details and pick out like, oh, which um, you know which solution is most durable, which solution is uh, is like the most cost efficient, that kind of thing. So you can you can kind of uh, you can kind of think about it in that way. Yeah, it's definitely like painting a picture was the essay exam. Um, and I also found that the multiple choice, like you did, that's when I'm talking about those differences, understanding differences of services, uh, because like they would obviously trick, try to, I don't know, trick you, but like different multiple choice, right? Different variations. And like, you had to know the difference between different services to like A versus B because it has that extra service in there, or it doesn't have that extra service or that specific type of instance or whatever. Um, so you do have to have, kind of like pick that apart. Um, and again, like you were saying, Tiffany, like look for those, I would call them buzzwords in the, um, in the questions because they're trying to point you to, uh, you know, a certain answer, really. They're trying to help you out um, at the end of the day. So those are your tips for those, because uh, I've noticed some of the questions are a little like, ah, I could be this, but it could be that one too, right? <laughs> I always was like, I'm never 100% confident that I'm getting this right. I, I always had that thought. Um, and I referred to that earlier with like doing the practice exams and being like, huh, like I thought I did better. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, um, I, I think the biggest thing I learned was like, take your time. I'd be like doing it, I'd be like rush because I saw the first buzzword and I'd be like, okay, I got to the answer. It was like, no, MK, continue, read through the whole prompt. Um, and be more patient with yourself because uh, there's a lot of a lot of information in the questions. Awesome. Someone asked, do you recommend O'Reilly resources and videos? Have y'all had any experience with those? 
I've had a little bit of experience with uh, their training sessions because I think they're moving more into this digital space where <clears throat> you know they're they're not even, they're canceling physical events, they're mm-hmm. canceling like physical hard copies of their books um you know they're shifting that over to different vendors and then they're they're pretty much just focusing on training videos and training material i don't know how helpful their material is for the aws certification exams but i do know that they're uh, it's a it's something that you can look into for um, kind of understanding enterprise applications. Like I, I read a lot of O'Reilly books. Um, there's a lot of great insights in there. Some O'Reilly books are better than others. Um, you'll see that across like various publications and, and different book publishers. But yeah, I, I think like if anyone like is interested in kind of just leveling up their skills, O'Reilly is a good place to do that. And like every Black Friday, they they cut like their annual subscription fee in half, like 50%. And so you can have like a year's worth of all of these, like all this O'Reilly knowledge for half the price. Wow. Normally like that price would only get you like three months of training. And, hmm. and that's just a heads up if anyone's looking at O'Reilly. I've been looking at it. I didn't put on that deal. I should have. I am always <clears throat> looking for O'Reilly books. That but that is great cool. Everybody keep it on your radar <laughs> after you've uh, had your turkey overdose, um, potentially hop it on uh, O'Reilly and getting um, some discounted uh, subscriptions. Uh, moving, someone loves Prague Prague too. I haven't heard of that. Let's, I'll have to look into that. Um, another question, going back to studying and in the spirit of preparing, how long did you all take to prepare? And can you talk a little bit? I think MK, you started to talk about your study routine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was the biggest thing for me. Um, and I, I preface this with I started studying for the AWS SA exam three different times uh, in the last two years. Uh, so (laughs) I would start and then like life would get in front of me and I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so what really changed for me was, uh, you know, quarantine hit and I was just like, come on, like, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. And it wasn't until I actually like told my career manager of my company, like, I'm going to have this exam done by the end of April. And I went into AWS and actually signed up for the exam. Honestly, you know, as I was just starting to get studying, um, with a, because you can change it. You can honestly, like you can push and it's like a blessing and a curse. You can push out the exam date. Um, <laughs> so I signed up for it knowing that, uh, and that's the biggest thing is I, first I told somebody, so like my goal was like held accountable to, and second, um, I set the exam date and then I filled in a study routine, like with the weeks in between. Um, I was pretty intense about it. I was like, I'm going to pound this out. Um, over the course of like about four ish weeks, I spent two weeks on all of the videos, um, which was about, you know, probably 12 to 15 hours, probably 15 hours a week for four weeks. Uh, so it was a pretty big time commitment. But again, I was at a certain life stage with quarantine and not having very much some social plans and everything else going on that I had the time to give and work was work wasn't overwhelming at the at the moment. So things were good. Um, but I broke it into like a micro schedule, I, I guess you could say micro goals. Like I want to finish every week. I would go in and be like, my high level goals were weeks one and weeks two. I wanted to be done with the uh, course material by X date. And I wanted to give myself two solid weeks about absorbing that material and studying that material. So that's kind of how I broke down my four weeks. Um, and again, it was pretty aggressive plan, but then for weeks one and weeks two, I would kind of literally map out by the module, which on which day I would do. So like Monday, I would do like three hours, Tuesday, I would do the next three modules, Thursday, you know what I mean? Um, and that's how I broke out my study routine. And that's the only way I was able to get myself to kind of commit. Um, and then, you know, life happens like, oh, I didn't have time to do that extra module. Okay, I'll push adjust my study routine. Um, but again, like my advice is like, what's your big goal? When do you want to have it done by? Um, and then kind of like break down into like smaller goals. Like today, I'm going to finish this section and take um, do those labs for that section. And then tomorrow, I'm going to do the next section. And I want to be done with, you know, the first half of the sections by the end of the week. And that's how I broke up my time, as well as like when I was studying for those two weeks, I would say, okay, Monday, you're going to do practice exam one, Thursday, you're going to do practice exam two, and Tuesday, Wednesday, you're going to study like what things you got wrong in that previous exam or review your notes for different sections. So 
that was that was how I do it. Uh, I did it like I could kind of show you an example of how I broke it down. But I would start every Monday and say like, what's my breakdown going to be like this week to stay on task. Um, Can I have your discipline? Like, <laughs> I've been telling myself that I'm going to get through this book and I'm going to read chapters one and two for like four weeks now. But I love that little tidbit about like when you tell someone. Yes, it, it wasn't it until I like literally had to tell my company that I was doing it and I had to submit documentation that I finished the certification. And I was like running up on the very last day of possibly doing it. So if anyone on this is feeling a little defeated by starting and stopping, like I stopped and started three times. So, uh, but what chair changed for me was telling somebody and also developing very small, like micro level goals as to how I want to complete all of, cause it's a lot of material. It's a crazy amount of material. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my tidbit advice. What about you, Tiffany? Oh my gosh, I uh, was not that responsible. I, it, okay, I looked at the, <laughs> I, had, um, I had a month to study. Basically, I had come into this, uh, to like my new role, and they were like, we are a AWS partner, startup partner, uh, so a couple of us need to get AWS certified <laughs> by a certain date, and um, and so, like, who wants to get certified, and everyone was just so busy that they were like, yeah, you know, like, the new person can do it, and so <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure, I don't know anything about AWS, and I had, like, and my manager was just like, yeah, you should check out, check out a cloud guru, look at that um, exam, like, it'll, uh, they, the training material will only take you like I think it tells you like oh it's 15 minutes or, or 15 hours or whatever and so I was like oh 15 hours I could do that all in a day like I've done online before. I've taken online classes before and like it did not take 15 hours okay <laughs> closer to like 30 or 45 hours for me um because like with all of the labs and then just like trying to make sure that you understand all the material like uh, I underestimated a lot of that. I had a month and then like, I was probably watching, I was still finishing a cloud guru videos the weekend I was about to take the test. <laughs> and so I knew like, I was like, my brain was just not going to be able to absorb everything. And so I just, I, I just got started on the practice exams. Like I had gotten through maybe um, a couple of the big sections and then I just took the practice exams and those practice exams humbled me and told me I didn't know like certain topics very well and so I'd go back and like finish rewatching it and through like taking the practice exams I take one practice exam go back to the videos take one practice exam and then like I was like okay I'm gonna run out of practice exams let me just finish the rest of the videos finish the rest of the videos like played it two times the speed finish the rest of the videos uh ace those practice exams and then took the test the next day <laughs> um I don't recommend that <laughs> but you can you take notes while you're watching I did uh, yeah, I did at first, and then I lost all discipline, and then I didn't, and then I, I just, I basically, like, through the Udemy platform, when you take those exams, like, those are two-hour practice exams, the John mm -hmm. Bond's practice exams are two hours, and I think there, there are more questions in the two hours, there's 70 questions, they're all really hard, some of them will, they'll tell you why you got it wrong, and then because you get get those types of questions wrong so many times, you realize like what your bad habits are when you're taking the exam. Like I know MK mentioned like she, she just needed to take, like her biggest tip is just to take your time. That was one of mine too. Like I noticed like I'd get questions wrong because I didn't read all of all, all the <laughs> all the prompts. Yeah. And oh my dang it, I knew it. <laughs> I'm not right if I just read the rest of the question. And so <laughs> I really recommend like taking those exams and, and paying attention to why you got them wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much, a lot of times you notice it's not because you don't understand a concept, it's just because of the way you take exams. And being able to, to say like, I don't wanna have bad habits when I go to take this exam for the first time is really important. That's awesome. We have one quick question and then I will close this off with a final question. Um, is, do you all know if the AWS Solutions Architect Associate is anag analogous? <laughs> Free has a hard time saying that word to the GCP Cloud Developer Associate exam. Do you know? I'm guessing it is more parallel to the developer exam. Just hearing that question, I'm not positive though. Um, I, I will say though, like looking at different cloud platforms and the different exams and certifications, like 
it's like I was looking at the AWS like more data science focused one right versus like the Azure one like that they were similar um, okay. I guess in, in, in practice but I don't know the full answer to that yeah the services might be called something different and so that yeah. I would I, I definitely wouldn't go into the GCP exam without studying for it or knowing like what the services are like the equivalent services at least um, right model and, and sort of the features may be different like you may not have feature parity across uh, services that's probably the only thing that I would be wary of awesome and our final question for you lovely ladies uh, do you have any tips your final takeaway tip to everyone who's listening today yeah, um, absolutely. So, I mean, I think I kind of went into them. For me, it was because I get so off task, it was creating very micro level goals um, and saying that's how I say discipline. Um, but it was more so like telling somebody your goal and having somebody hold you accountable. Like my crew manager called and was just like, how's it going? Like it was supposed to be end of the month. You know, you've been telling me you've been, you're going to get this certification for two years, MK. It was kind of one of those phone calls. Um, and that's just the time I had. Um, but I also, like, I think beyond the certification, one of the biggest things and most challenging things was um, taking a look at my work, again, through the lens of having been certified um, and continue, like, as you're learning to, like, have I seen this uh, before in my job or my role or have I heard somebody talk about this or did I learn about this concept somewhere else? Um, it it kind of helped me piece together, um, like, taking a look at our enterprise solution and going back into AWS having been certified and being like, oh, that's how these things work. Um, or, you know, I was studying for it and uh, we were having an issue with an Amazon service and instead of just, like, messaging the DevOps team, hey, can you fix it? I was like, hey, like, I'm curious, is this how you would go about looking into it? Um, and, and for me, like, the being able to understand concepts and test on concepts, like, there's a piece of understanding for me in application. Um, and I would say, try to find that application here or there. Um, and also don't be afraid to like rewatch videos or like sometimes different resources, like set it better than, you know, necessarily the video. If I read it on the Amazon white paper, I was like, oh, that makes a little bit more sense um, in digesting that information. So yeah, I don't know. I could ramble about it forever. <laughs> All great tips. Love it. Yeah. I love, I love that advice. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll, a lot of these concepts will reemerge. Like I, I saw that, especially because like before I got in the AWS exam, I'd gotten OpenShift certified, which is like the equivalent, well, pretty equivalent to Kubernetes certified. And so I knew a lot of, a, a lot of like the concepts around real reliabilities, elasticity. And so you'll see, you'll see those things emerge over time and it'll give you confidence too. I think like getting, if you're studying for this exam, know that like, it's really investing in yourself, right? You're, you're, you're training yourself, you're giving, you, and those opportunities, like it'll open the door for so many more opportunities. And even, even to be able to, to say like, Hey, I've seen this before. And like, even just like building up sort of that muscle around technology, it's, it's just really awesome. And so, yeah, one of my, my biggest tips is just like, have confidence in yourself, know that you can do it. Some days you just feel like, Oh crap, I don't know anything. Like this is going to go horribly. Like some days I was just like, I could just, not get certified like I could just fail I could just fail but you know the important thing is that you tell yourself like you can do this you can you can set this goal and you can meet this and so you know we have the AWS um, study group reach out to people um, you know if you're worried like don't worry everybody's been there people have testing anxiety it's, you're not alone you can do it and and so yeah we're, we're here awesome I cannot thank you ladies enough for sharing not only your morning and your time with us, but also just this amazing insight, um, your wisdom and your experience. I know I found so much value out of, it, out of it and I'm super excited to figure out how I plan like MK and <laughs> uh, tackle this uh, certification in the near future. Truly, truly, truly thank you from the bottom of uh, the Women Who Code team's heart. Um, I will wrap us up here in the next few minutes. That concludes our fireside chat, folks. Uh, if we were all in person, I think you would get a standing ovation round of applause. That was awesome. Seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you. A quick reminder on how you can stay connected. Our social media pages, Twitter, Instagram, 
joining us for on womenwhocode.com, um, seeing what events we have. If you are interested in potentially starting a AWS study group and figuring out how our community can swarm and swirl together, uh, feel free to email myself and Archna at cloud at womenwhocode.com. And then as we mentioned and alluded to a lot, there is this Slack community for Women Who Code. If you are not in it um, and missed the links from Archna in our Slack or in the chat today, you can also email us. And it, not only is it a vibrant and active community where you get to meet with all the amazing women who are and uh, individuals who are a part of uh, this group, but there is a AWS study group channel where we can share or we will be sharing the resources for um, today's talk and continuing to encourage each other and have conversations about the things that we discover in all of our journeys to getting cloud certified. Um, and this will be uploaded on YouTube if you want to share it with any of your friends, coworkers, peers um, who are also pursuing their certification. Last but not least, we would love, 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 love your feedback on today's session. Uh, any ad advice, input on what you would like to see in the future. You can take a picture of this screen with your phone. Um, and so, and it's also on this next screen without further ado. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, MK, and thank you, Tiffany, for uh, gracing us with this amazing wisdom and uh, joining our talk. I look forward to chatting with the rest of you in the near future. Have a fabulous Friday. And that's all I have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.